Hey, good morning, everybody. It's good to have you back with us this morning. It is Wednesday morning, uh, St. Patrick's Day. And so I guess there's the big thing of you got to wear green on St. Patrick's Day. Here's the great thing about being colorblind is every day I'm wearing green, at least in my mind I am. So uh, I'm immune to uh, the uh, whole pinching thing. So anyway, I hope you do have a good day and hopefully it's a, a day you can be a blessing to someone else and that you will be blessed by God as well and uh, all those different things. Hey, if you can be in prayer for our student ministry, we got middle school and high school students uh, traveling back uh, from their mission trip. Uh, they should be getting back this afternoon. So pray for good safety on the roads for them today. Um, praying for our uh, late kids ministry stuff tonight and student ministry tonight. We've got adult classes tonight as well. Um, this Sunday, I want to remind you, we will uh, continue in our message series um, uh, on the Passion Week, looking at the final week of Jesus' life. This week we'll be looking at another parable in the book of Matthew chapter 25 and how he, um, how Jesus gives us some insight into how we should live and how we should operate and uh, we get another picture of his heart for us, his devotion to us and to mankind and how we should model that kind of attitude and posture as well. So uh, a lot to be discussed in those things uh, this afternoon or this weekend coming up. Uh, so be in prayer about that, that's for sure. Um, so today we're back in our series on the book of Philippians. We're in chapter 4. We're almost to the end of the book of Philippians. And then we will start uh, a new study. Um, but in Philippians chapter 4, um, Paul is just kind of wrapping up his letter. He's giving him his final words. So a lot of what he says here in this last few verses of chapter 4 it's just kind of this rapid fire, uh, just great information, good reminders, good principles to live by, um, right? Last Yesterday we talked about the idea that he tells us, hey, you just got to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in what God is doing, not in your circumstances, but what God is doing. Uh, he talks about in every situation um, that we don't have to be anxious because we can, by prayer, lay our burdens before the Lord and he will take care of us. He will sustain us. He will give us what we need in this life. And so we love that idea and that peace will transcend our heart and transcend our, our understanding. Um, so verse 8 is where we left off yesterday. I'm going to read this verse 8 and verse 9 here today. And then we'll talk a little bit about that. This is kind of the blueprint for positive thinking, uh, if we were going to call it that. But this is what Paul says. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. So a couple things he says there. He lists uh, uh, several items there that we should think on. He says, whatever is all these things, true, noble, admirable, praiseworthy, all this stuff, think on this stuff. I want us to understand when he says think on this stuff, the word think there meant to dwell. Um, a word that we don't use a lot in our culture today, but is another good word to use here is to ruminate, right? It is to really focus, think, uh, let those things capture your mind. Uh, things that are good, things that are pleasing, things that are pure, things that are trustworthy, all those different things and admirable. Those are the things that we should, that should capture our thoughts. Um, the problem in our culture today is there are so many competing things out there. Um, we are bombarded today, absolutely bombarded by information, by stimuli that will um, distract us or excite us in different ways. Um, uh, statistics show that we, on an average day, um, on an average day in the 21st century today, we are bombarded with so much information, right? That we're bombarded in a day's in a day's time, we're bombarded by uh, by more information that some people in years past would have ever been exposed to in their lifetime. Um, we are inundated with distractions and information. And things that we're trying to process, is it true, is it not true, is it beneficial, is it, is it detrimental to my life? 
all this stuff that is bombarding us. And so Paul here is telling the church, listen, I want you to know that the things you should dwell on are these things. He said, I want you to dwell on things that are whatever is, whatever is true, right? This idea of being true um, obviously is the opposite of falsehood. Um, there were a lot of false teachers in those, in those days, as there are today. There are a lot of people that will teach false doctrine. They'll teach false theology. Uh, the idea of taking the scripture and not making it what it really is and twisting it uh, to fit their own agenda. There's a lot of that that goes on. He says, but I want you to dwell on what is true. If you want to know what true is, we root ourselves in the word of God. That's our foundation. If we don't know the word of God, then we don't know what truth is. Truth is also whatever is opposite of Satan. Uh, so our enemy is our deceiver. He's, a decep he's a deceptive in his nature. He's the father of lies. And so he is the one that wants to distort our view of reality. Um, truth is what grounds us um, to what God wants us to do. Whatever is noble, right? Uh, the idea of nobility, the idea of royalty, the idea of what God is doing, God's mission, God's plan. Not my will, Father, but your will be done. Let's dwell on those things. Um, whatever is right, uh, whatever is correct, whatever is good for us, right? whatever is pleasing to God. Um, then he says, whatever is pure, whatever is pure. Um, Here's, here's the thing about purity. Purity is one of those things that sometimes it's easy for us to, uh, what's the right word, to rationalize. Um, and we think in terms of our own understanding, we say things like, well, it's not that bad, right? Um, something we talk about in our staff meeting quite often here at church is, is how we hear people say things often that, well, I watched a movie the other day. Um, it, it only had a little bit of bad stuff in it, but it was a pretty good movie. Um, or this TV show was really nice. It, it only had a little bit of stuff in it that, that was bad. Here's the thing. A little bit of stuff is not good, right? We, we rationalize things of that nature. In the scripture, there is either pure or impure. It's not kind of halfway. There's no like half-heartedness. There's not like you're, you're kind of okay and lukewarm. We understand, we understand the danger of lukewarm living. Um, so it's either pure or it's impure. Um, listen, if you were to travel, if you were to take off on a travel uh, route and you traveled to, I don't know, let's say you traveled to South America, um, or let's say you traveled to Haiti. Uh, there's a lot of people that go to Haiti for mission trips and stuff. If you go to Haiti, um, I would say that most likely, if you know anything, uh, and, and you would probably study this, um, if you went to Haiti, you would not just walk into any store and turn on any tap water and drink that water. Um, you would, first of all, if you did, <laughs> you would regret it uh, radically. Uh, it would not be a good experience, most likely, if you were to just drink any kind of tap water especially in any kind of third world country. Um, why? Because there's impurities in the water. Now, we could look at that water, and we could look at that and think, it looks good, uh, it's clear, I can see through it, I don't see things floating inside of it. Um, but those impurities are microscopic. Um, but nonetheless, they are real. And nonetheless, they are, uh, they are damaging uh, to your intestinal tract. Um, and the reason I say that is because sometimes in our life we think, well, it's not that bad. But as Paul says, whatever is pure, you dwell on these things. That means that if it's impure, we should guard ourselves against it. We should, we should caution ourselves against that. So don't, I would just, I would just encourage us to think, are we rationalizing things, um, because we think it's okay. Uh, he says, whatever is, uh, whatever is lovely and whatever is admirable. Um, I love the idea of admirable. Uh, is that something you'd be proud of? Uh, are other people proud of what you're thinking on and dwelling on? Um, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things, right? Dwell on these things. Let those things govern our mind. Let those things dominate our thoughts. What is governing us? Um, the other dynamic there that I think is important is what we ingest um, 
makes us who we are, right? Um, it, it's the idea that what what goes in comes out, right? And you've heard us talk about that all the time, the idea of garbage in and garbage out. You fill your mind with impurity and impurity comes out. Um, you fill your heart with corruption and that eventually will filter out in our life. Um, it filters out in our speech, it filters out in our behaviors, it filters out in the way we communicate with other people, all that kind of stuff. And so we have to be super conscious of this dynamic um, in our life. What are you feeding into your life? And then he says in verse nine, I love this, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. I would, I, two things I wanna say about this. One, who are you learning from? Who are you, who are you uh, sitting under in terms of mentorship? Who are, who are you learning from? Um, the other question I would say is who are you modeling for? Um, and so Paul lived a life in such high character that he said, whatever you have heard from me, or whatever you learned from me, or received from me, or heard from me, or seen in me, my, like lived out, you model me. Is that something we can say? Can you say to your kids, hey, what you see in me, you imitate. What you, how I respond to people, I want you to imitate that. Can you say to your coworkers, hey, you guys can pattern your life after me because then you'll be uh, following Jesus. Is that the pattern of our life? Are we living such uh, wholesome lives that we would want people to follow us? And then he says, finally, he says, you put those things into practice. It's one thing to believe, right? We talk about this all the time. It's one thing to believe in Jesus. It's one thing to say we belong to you. It is another thing to live for Jesus. Um, and James says, if we are not willing to live like Jesus, then we are not really his. Um, do we look like Jesus in our life, in our attitude, in our speech? I just encourage you to think in those um, regards. Let's pray. God, thank you for today and for your word. Uh, thank you for the completeness of your word, how it affects every aspect of our life. I do pray, God, that you'd help us to be faithful, help us to be surrendered, help us to dwell on the things that honor you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, we hope you have a great day today. Uh, I look forward to seeing you tonight. Hopefully you can make it tonight. Uh, men's class, women's class, another adult class for the book of Genesis. Love to have you join us. And um, it's going to be a great time. God bless. And we'll see you tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. See you then.